Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jim Raudiola, the Intermediate Cop Country Intermediate School District Superintendent, and welcome to the 2022 UP Educators Conference. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Rice, uh, our State Superintendent. Uh, Dr. Rice uh, has began his tenure with the Michigan Michigan Superintendent in 2019. Uh, prior to that. Uh, he served 17 years in public education as a school administrator uh, in Kalamazoo schools, uh, Clifton, New Jersey. And he also was a French teacher um, in Washington, D.C. public schools. He is the 44th superintendent for our state. Um, it is a pleasure to get to know Dr. Rice. Uh, he has visited the Copper Country. Uh, on one occasion, I had the, the opportunity to tour local schools with him. Um, he has been in the UP multiple times. And kind of an interesting fun fact, uh, one of our local legislators, uh, Representative Greg Markinen, ran into Dr. Rice. I don't know if it was at a coffee shop or legislative lunch and wherever it was, but they had a short conversation and uh, it sort of ended with uh, Dr. Rice, be the first state superintendent to visit the entire UP. And I'll tell you what folks, this guy has not let us down. Um, I am so proud of the fact that Dr. Rice is touring our local schools He's a part of, of what we're trying to do, and he's a strong advocate for kids. So thank you, Dr. Rice, for everything that you do for public education. And please give Dr. Rice a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that kind introduction. And um, good morning to, uh, to all of you. I'm um, in a, a humble mode this morning. Um, I lost a, a good friend um, uh, prior to being a superintendent, but after um, teaching high school French, I went to graduate school. I came out and I was the business administrator in a number of school districts, including Fort Wayne Community Schools in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And Dale Paul Sherman, my amazing director of fiscal affairs, recently passed, so I'll be going to his funeral later today. So I'm in a little bit of a subdued uh, mood this morning, but so appreciative to spend some time with you, our UP educators this morning. Um, I want to begin by thanking you. I want to thank you uh, for your courage and outstanding work in this very, very difficult time. I also want to thank uh, those schools and school districts that have welcomed me in the UP over the last uh, three and a half years. Um, you can see some of them on this slide. You can see some of them on the next slide as well. I've not been to the entirety of the UP and I don't claim to um, um, fully uh, have knowledge of the entire Upper Peninsula. But what I do share with you is my commitment to continue to grow my knowledge in order to better serve you, and more importantly, to better serve the young people in the uh, Upper Peninsula. I would be remiss if I did not thank um, very specifically the former uh, ISD superintendent in Eastern UPISD, uh, Dan Riator, who was very, very helpful uh, when I first got this position. I'd also like to thank NMU Dean Joe Lubig, and a, and a special shout out to Nanette Hansen. We're very, very proud of you, not simply for your career as a first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary, but also um, for being the 2022-2023 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Uh, UP educators, this is gonna be our agenda for, uh, for today. Um, I'm gonna to touch on the state's top 10 strategic education plan and I'm going to narrow my focus 
uh, increasingly to the teacher shortage because I've been asked to focus primarily on that. But I believe that the entire strategic education plan affects the teacher shortage. And by extension, the teacher shortage affects the entire strategic education plan. So with your forbearance, I'm going to cast a wider net initially and then narrow it down subsequently. So Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan uh, was approved by the um, Michigan State Board of Education in August of 2020, eight goals, metrics associated with each of these goals. Next slide, please. These are the eight goals. And what you realize um, if you study the top 10 strategic education plan is that the two resource upstream goals, goals seven and eight, addressing of the teacher shortage and adequate and equitable school funding respectively, help drive everything else downstream. Similarly, the two developmental upstream goals, goals one and two, addressing the expansion of early childhood education and the improvement of early literacy, as well as goal three, health, safety, and wellness, help drive everything else downstream. Goals four, five, and six, the secondary school program expansion, including CTE and addressing CTE deserts across the state, high school graduation rate increases, and post-secondary credential rate increases, respectively. The fiscal year 23 budget negotiated between the governor and the state legislature with an enormous amount of input from local educators, from the State Department of Education, from many in the education advocacy community, supports all eight goals of the state's top 10 strategic education plan. This is in many ways a generational budget. And I will tell you educators that this budget uh, is the most extraordinary budget I've ever seen in my career. And I go back almost 40 years in public education. I will tell you also that it is the most complicated education budget that I have seen in my career as well. Goal eight, the provision of adequate and equitable school funding. Remember that's an upstream goal because funding helps everything else downstream. And in that regard, we appreciate enormously the $450 per pupil increase in uh, foundation allowance. We also appreciate the fact that the legislature understands that different children have different needs. And it's taken us a long time to get the legislature to understand this, that different children have different needs, different needs, different costs, and that this budget includes almost a half billion dollars to continue building out a weighted funding model to address the different costs associated with educating different young people. This budget includes almost a quarter of a billion dollars additionally to educate our students with disabilities because we've underfunded our students with disabilities enormously in the state over many years. It includes $235 million additionally for economically disadvantaged children, our children on free or reduced price lunch. It includes $10 million to improve career and technical education programming. It includes $1.3 million to um, boost the education of English learners. It includes $438,000 for students in rural and isolated districts. All of these increases, every one of those increases, at least a 5.2% increase, and a few of those healthy double digit increases. The other thing that this budget does that helps, again, everything else downstream, because more resources helps pay teachers better, more resources helps support teachers better, and all of that helps us educate young people better. This budget includes $475 million in the school consolidation and infrastructure fund. The governor in her budget, February 9th, 2022, recommended to the legislature $1 billion for a school infrastructure modernization fund, specifically for those school districts, some of which are represented in the Zoom room today, that do not have high assessed values, high property tax values, and can't afford a capital millage or a sinking fund. She recommended a billion dollars. 
what she got was $475 million in what I would call a split fund, a fund that includes school consolidation, which she did not ask for, and, uh, and the infrastructure fund, which she did ask for. So it's $237.5 million for infrastructure. This will help a number of our UP school districts. This is a very stamp, substantial beginning in the legislature funding the capital needs of poor districts that can't fund those capital needs with a capital millageur sinking fund. And as a result, has to do one of two things, either to fund those needs out of the general fund, which shoves dollars out of the classroom or foregoing particular um, expenditures. Some things can't be foregone and they get taken out of a general fund at the expense of the education of our young people, for example, a roof replacement. And some things just don't happen, um, which is really an, an enormous shame. This is a, a tremendous benefit for uh, school districts and particularly lower assessed value districts across the state. Go to the next slide. So I, I think the point of, of focusing on goal eight on adequate and equitable school funding is we've underfunded public schools in the um, in the state for many years. In fact, an MSU study noted that between 1995 and 2015, we were dead last in the nation among states in total revenue growth inflation adjusted for that 20 year period of time. And what you know, if you've studied school finance is that remains in our revenue base in every local school district, all 835 of them across the state. And for that matter, in the 56 ISDs as well. More funding helps us compensate staff more and better, helps us support staff more and better, and by extension, helps us support young people more and better. Let's talk directly about goal seven, addressing the teacher shortage. For quite some time, we had a lot of deniers in the state legislature. They would say, well, there isn't a teacher shortage or there is a teacher shortage somewhere, but it's not in my district. And I can remember having a conversation with then Speaker Chatfield in his office when I began this position a little bit more than three, three and a quarter years ago. And I remember saying to him, Speaker, we've got a tremendous teacher shortage. We need your support to address this teacher shortage. He said, well, you know, Superintendent, we may have a teacher shortage somewhere in the state, but it's, it's not in my district. It's not everywhere. And I said to him, I said, Speaker, I'm going to be in your district in a few weeks. I'm going to be in the Eastern UP. And here's the deal I'd like to make with you. I'm going to have this conversation with um, local superintendents, local principals. And if they tell me that there is no teacher shortage, I'm going to call you uh, back and I'm going to say, Speaker, you were right. Uh, there is no teacher shortage in the Eastern UP. I was wrong and I admit it. But if on the other hand, they tell me what I think they're going to tell me, which is the teacher shortage is alive and well, not simply in the Eastern UP, but across the, the state, they're going to be picking up the phone and they're going to be calling you. And what we encouraged educators across the state, particularly our superintendents, was to pick up the phone, call their legislators, call the 148 people that get to vote in the state legislature and urge them over a period of time to help address the teacher shortage that they helped create with the underfunding of public education over a period of years. It took us some time, educators. We got $5 million in, in the first effort in fiscal year 21, which was a paltry sum, but it was a foot in the door. Fiscal year 22, we got less than $2 million for Grow Your Own programs. And finally, after hammering on the door over the last three years, we, uh, we put together a series of initiatives from the Department of Education um, and the state legislature uh, in negotiations with the governor ended up funding $575 million in uh, teacher shortage initiatives. You go to the next slide, you can see some of these initiatives, $305 million for what the legislature called Michigan Future Educator Fellowships, which I would call scholarships for young people studying to be teachers, $175 million for Grow Your Own programs for support staff to become teachers, because educators 
We know we aren't what we are. We know what we're capable of becoming. At some point in our lives, we weren't what we are now, but someone said we were capable of becoming what we are now. A teacher, a sports staff member, principal, superintendent, and we believe them. We poured into our preparation, others poured into us, and we became something more than we were. And in that same spirit, we want to pour into the support staff members who have brilliant relationships with our kids, the foundation of great teaching, and, and who have an interest in and a capability of becoming uh, teachers. $50 million for, excuse me, if we could go back to that, $50 million for uh, Michigan Future Educator Student Teacher Stipends. We think this is important. It is not a buyer's market anymore. It's a seller's market at this point. It's a seller's market. You have to incentivize in a different way. And particularly if we are looking at grow your own programs for uh, young people who do not have an enormous amount of money, support staff members who are working to support themselves and going through school, we're going to have to pay for that last um, semester or in the case of MSU that last year. Uh, where there is student teaching, and then $10 million for ISDs to work on CTE um, instructor recruitment. So each of these efforts is really going to help us chip away at the teacher shortage in the coming years. But you know that just as it takes 18 years to grow a high school graduate and 21, 22 years to grow a college graduate. It takes time to grow a teacher as well. And these efforts are not as simple as add water and stir. So you go to the next slide. And we, we have begun to reflect uh, about two sets of additional initiatives. The one set of additional initiatives are place-based initiatives. There's a recent MSU education report, if you haven't seen it, it's entitled Educational Opportunities and Community Development in Rural Michigan, a Roadmap for State Policy. This is David Larson's, or David Arson's report, which he did with uh, a number of his colleagues at MSU. And it talks about the particular challenges in rural districts, not simply in UP, but across the, across the state. And it urges place-based initiatives to address these challenges. Go to the next slide. In this spirit, uh, a year before the MSU Rural Education Report was put out, we put forward a recommendation to the legislature among our recommendations to address the teacher shortage last November. Uh, we had a recommendation to strengthen the teacher preparation pipeline in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower. And essentially the idea was to create greater support for Northern uh, Michigan University. We know that um, Northern does a terrific job, but we need to have additional strength in the, the UP and in the Northern Lower that supports uh, educator preparation and development. Um, Lake State is a small program. Can we strengthen that? Michigan Tech is, is on pause. Can we revivify uh, that? So there, there are um, efforts underway to rethink what a place-based approach might be up north in the, um, in the state. And I will tell you that we are going to be recommending some version of this idea again this year, only with more flesh on the bone, um, to the governor and the state legislature. But it does prompt the question, um, we've got a lot more money than we've had, but it takes time to develop staff. And uh, putting money in the teacher salary schedule is very, very important. There's no question about that, particularly at the lower end of the teacher salary uh, schedule. It's also very, very clear that uh, providing more supports for our students and staff helps build efficacy of our staff, helps build a sense of capability, helps our staff be successful with our young people. At the same time, what do we need to accomplish now to increase the pool of staff members? Well, we have three bills that are current in the state legislature that we believe are important. The first is an effort 
uh, a partnership with Senator McBroom. He's uh, the senator of a number of you in this Zoom room. And uh, this partnership on Senate Bill 861 would streamline the certification process to allow for easier entry of veteran teachers certified outside of the state initially to come into Michigan to teach. Now we have about a thousand educators a year who are initially certified outside of the state subsequently inside the state of Michigan. But we think we can do more and better than uh, that. We also think that veteran teachers certified uh, elsewhere, uh, having gone through a teacher prep program elsewhere, we believe that those um, teachers ought to be able to come in and be teachers without taking the MTTC. If you're a veteran teacher in Wisconsin, you've taught there for five years, you went to um, uh, University of Wisconsin teaching certificate, we think we ought to reduce the regulatory barrier to entry. Senate Bill 942 would do the same thing for counselors. House Bill 6411 would create more substitute teacher flexibility for support staff members. It is akin to what the legislature passed for a six month period of time last year, but with more protections for our young people. We're working very hard to get these done in the lame duck session. The legislature's attention is diffuse and isn't always focused on what we think will have um, important benefits for students and staff. So goal three of the state's top 10 strategic education plan speaks to the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of students. And I might add that as, as we improve the health, safety, and wellness of students, we improve the health, safety, and wellness of staff. As we support students, we support staff. And this support of students, this $245 million student mental health support, we believe strengthens the teaching profession as well, because if there are more supports around teachers, we reduce the leakiness in the pipeline on the back end. Not so it's not a front end issue, it's a back end issue. It's the it's the teachers who struggle with class sizes, which may not be um, reasonable. It's teachers that don't have um, social workers or counselors or uh, nurses. To, um, to send children to if they have need. So let's look at these $245 million in the fiscal year 23 budget, $150 million to districts for discretionary mental health needs, $45 million to ISDs for an increase in the TRAILS program, $25 million to expand existing funding for school-based health centers. And then $25 million to expand mental health grants to ISDs for mental health professionals and school mental health centers. I will tell you that in 2018, when I was finishing my what would be my 17th and final year um, as a local school superintendent, the state legislature added the first $30 million for school mental health issues in the state of Michigan. Now, $30 million sounds like a lot. $20 per kid doesn't sound like a lot, and they are the same thing in the state of Michigan. Last year, fiscal year 22, we had $240 million added to help us increase the number of guidance counselors, school nurses, school psychs, school social workers. We added more than 600 in the state. That's a big deal. I'm not suggesting we're, we're, we're there. I'm not suggesting we've arrived. I'm suggesting we're arriving. And I think this is cause for tremendous optimism. And we've got to build out our helping professional fields just as we have to rebuild the teacher profession. But we've got money to do it with the educators. And that is cause for optimism. No longer cause for pause that we had previously. So we also have $210 million additionally in the state budget for student safety. Of that $210 million, $168 million 
goes directly to uh, public schools or non-public schools, 150 million to public schools, 18 million for um, non-public schools to strengthen the public safety of those schools. Go to the next slide. $25 million explicitly for the hiring of school safety officers. Go to the next slide. $15 million for what we call cross-system intervention support. This helps us um, look at the uh, relationships among schools, community mental health systems, and local police departments so that we're able to compare um, notes, systems, reflections on children who have particular challenges. And I think what we know is that the young people who commit these horrifying genocidal acts in schools, they've been ticking for a period of years and they're known to different systems in different ways. And we simply need to work better cross systems. And this $15 million would help us, uh, would help us do that. And then $2 million for school safety and mental health commission within, within the department. We believe that the more we can support the health, safety, and wellness of our children, of our staff, the more we can strengthen the teacher profession as as well. People leave the profession for a host of reasons. They leave the profession because um, it, it doesn't pay as well as it could, uh, but they also leave the profession because they feel in many cases a, um, a lack of efficacy, a lack of capability given the conditions under which they operate. And we really need to change those conditions in the state of Michigan. And that begins with money, but it's not all about money. I'm aware that it's not all about money, but that it's not all about money doesn't mean that it isn't at all about money. It most, assert, it most assuredly is in part about money. You can't buy staff and you can't pay staff what they're worth without money. You can't support staff and support students without money. Now, there's a lot more than simply money, but the idea that we can get it done without money, I think is, is fatuous. This is a generational budget. It helps us begin to build out the sort of system, sort of schools for our young people that they need, that they deserve. And by extension, it helps us build out the staffing that permit us to get it done for our, um, for our young people. I'm reminded that when I was in Northern New Jersey as a superintendent back in the day when, when I was young and Jim Raudiola was younger, um, I had a nurse in every one of my 14 elementary schools. I had two nurses in my two middle schools, which had 1,300 kids plus um, in each one. I had three nurses in a 3,400 kid high school. I moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan as the superintendent, and I had three nurses in a district of 11,000. We have some of the highest ratios in, among our helping professionals in the country, and we need to change that. We need more guidance counselors, nurses, school social workers, school psychologists. The good news is that our state legislature finally gets this and is substantially funding in negotiation with the governor, school mental health, number one, school safety, number two, and directly funding efforts to help be rebuild the teaching profession, which I think it helped tear down by underfunding public education. Um, we go to the next slide. So I, I, I can't thank you enough for what you are doing for children at this moment. As I um, go into schools across the state, not simply in the Upper Peninsula, but elsewhere as well, I am really profoundly touched 
by uh, how people are in many cases making a way out of no way that they are that they are um, struggling to cobble it together for young people. I believe that we are on the upswing educators. I believe very strongly that um, that the funding, that the addressing of the teacher shortage, that the addressing of children's mental health and public safety, that the funding precedes the improvement in the profession and in educational outcomes, that they go hand in glove, that we can't get it done without the requisite financial and human resources on the one hand, and all of that that flows downstream from that. I wish the best of luck for the 2022-2023 school year. I'm so appreciative of you, so appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you today. Have a great one. Thank you. Good morning. I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Sines to the UP Education Conference today. Dr. Sines has earned multiple degrees and awards, but the most important for us today includes his work with schools and families in the area of social emotional intelligence and the dynamics of relationship-based learning. His life journey demonstrates what impact an educator can have on others. He offers practical skills and to help develop and maintain effective relationships with every student every day. If you have questions for Dr. Sines, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if there's time, I'm sure he will answer them. So at this time, thank you and good morning, Dr. Sines. Good morning. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Greetings from College Station, Texas, way down south. Um, it's great to be with you. Before I even jump in, um, let me stop and go to the chat. And I want to—I want you to say, Adam, we see you and we hear you. I want to make sure that, that our tech is good because I don't want to get 10 minutes into it and then realize that you can't even hear me. So let's look at the chat. Oh, look at that. All good, says Jacob. Thank you so much. All right. I appreciate that feedback. Um, Again, before I jump in, another thing I want to say, thank you, Dr. Rice, for, for your comments. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, and I'll, I will confess my bias as a licensed psychologist, but I am thrilled about your state's goal number three, uh, looking at mental health support. Um, what I appreciate about what Michigan is doing is that you're, you're not in denial. Um, some states are in denial. They're just not accepting that there is um, a mental health crisis on the heels of the pandemic. And in my opinion, um, we were here before the pandemic. The pandemic didn't cause this. I, in my opinion, it just exacerbated it. So I just love that the state of Michigan is being real about that, being honest, talking about it, and uh, allocating funds to, to deal with the problem. So uh, kudos, kudos to your state and to all of you. I fell in love with Michigan in August, man. I was in um, Calhoun County, uh, ISD in Battle Creek, and then I drove up to Huron ISD in Bad Axe, Michigan. And let me just stop and say, I could say Bad Axe for, for 38 times and not get tired of that. I love that, that town. If I was from there, I would tell everybody that I was from Bad Axe because it sounds like another cool phrase that I won't repeat. But as I was there in August uh, in um, Battle Creek and then again in Bad Axe, see, I just said it again, um, the, the, the y'all were just wonderful and warm and encouraging and loving and kind. And the, um, the drive was beautiful. And so I've just got a new appreciation for Michigan. So, uh, great to be with you. Um, let me show you just, this is just the geography nerd in me. Forgive me for just one sec. Um, let me see. I'm trying to pull up. There it is. Let me, let me flip over here to my map. There we go. Um, so you guys, this really freaked me out. Um, I um, realized that, you know, I, I thought when I went to like Detroit and then to Battle Creek and then up to, when I got to Bad Axe, I thought like, I think this is the North Pole. I thought you can't get any further North and you guys are all the way up here. That just freaks me out that you're North of Toronto. 
I am right here in sort of centralish Texas. Um, and um, yeah, so it's great to be with you. Um, sorry, I just had to, <laughs> I had to do that little geography lesson. Let me show you um, where I am. So I am in my studio here in College Station, Texas. Um, I um, I remember what happened was in March of 2020, April 2020, when this whole when the world changed. Um, the word on the street back then was, "Hey, Adam, um, you know they're going to start doing um, training and conferences virtually on Zoom." And I remember back then, I literally asked. What is Zoom? I didn't even know what Zoom was. <laughs> I've figured it out. And so I told my my staff, you know, we do a lot of professional development across the country in school districts. And I said, listen, if we're going to do virtual, we need to make it worth people's while. So we need to up our game. So we built this studio. And um, over the last two years, man, we've just done countless hours and hours and days and days of professional development out of the studio. So this is where I'm coming from my studio here in college station um let me show you one other camera angle I, I want you to see this so what i figured out early on doing virtual trainings is that um when you present live um and you try to keep energy up you tell jokes right to keep people engaged when you're presenting live when you tell a bad joke 20% of the people, they're going to laugh just out of pity. You know, it's like, a, like, oh, bless his heart. Ha, ha, ha. He's trying so hard. Um, and sometimes, like, you just take those crumbs as a presenter and you move on. But what I figured out back in, like, April or May of 2020 is that when you're presenting to a camera in your studio in College Station, you get no laugh back, right? Even at your good stuff. And it really, it threw my timing off as a, as a presenter. You know, I would, I would tell a joke and I would wait for laughter and it wouldn't come. So this piece of machinery here is like my salvation. Uh, I, we do podcasts out of the studio and this is a soundboard, a uh, mixing board. And then there are some, some sounds in here that I use to help me. Um, so I use technology to support myself. So I'm going to explain what I mean. You're going to hear random sounds throughout the morning and the day. And I want to show you where they're from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell two bad jokes and then I'm going to show you how I use my technology to support. Here's the first bad joke. Um, and I say bad joke, really, that's the only kind that I know. Um, psychology joke. How many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? Answer. It only takes one. The narcissist holds onto the light bulb and expects the world to revolve around him. Now watch this. <laughs> See there? That's my laugh track. So this is gonna be this is gonna be like a an episode of Seinfeld. Um, I'll tell one more bad joke and then we'll be done here. Round of applause that you won't have after this bad joke, you won't have to hear anymore. Here's my next one. School joke. Someone broke into the library last night and stole all of our dictionaries. Stole all of our dictionaries. This morning, we are at a loss for words. I'll boo myself. I'm not above that. <laughs> so, there you go. So that, that those are my buttons. If you hear these sounds, it's just me and my ADHD getting triggered. So there you go. So that's the studio. I'm in College Station. You're in way up northern Michigan, and it's great to be together. Let me hang on one sec. I'm going to flip over to my PowerPoint, and then we're going to jump right in. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Off to the PowerPoint. Let me maximize that. Awesome. Good morning, Upper Peninsula. Here we go. Um, I have two goals in my time with you today. Number one, um, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Like these last two years have just been nuts, you know, and I'm a psychologist and a school psychologist. I started my career in around 2000 working in schools. My wife is an occupational therapist. She does OT and assistive technology for our school district. So we're school people and we're special ed people. And man, it's just been, um, I think special ed anyway is difficult and challenging. Um, but, um, you know, the pandemic has really made it difficult. So I want to encourage you. It's been a, it's been a difficult uh, journey so far. And um, I think we could all use some encouragement. So that's goal number one is I want you, well, I want to encourage you. And here's my bold claim. 
not only am I going to encourage you in this first little keynote session that I'm doing, here's the bold claim. I'm going to give you proof that what you do in education, it doesn't just matter. It matters for generations. Like it literally, you're making a difference in generations yet to come. So I'll, I'll prove that to you. So that's my bold claim. And you're going to be encouraged. You're going to know that what you do is very, very essential and very, very impactful. Number two, um, throughout my breakout sessions for the rest of the day, I want to equip you. I want to equip you. I want to give you tools. You know, like you're you're sort of a Swiss Army knife in education, and I just want to add a couple of couple more tools to that toolkit you got. Um, and um, so the the deal with that, you know, if if you look there, um, you'll see that um, you know the EQ here is in green and I, like I do that. So EQ is a shorthand. Most of us know what IQ is. EQ is emotional quotient. IQ is intellectual quotient. EQ is emotional quotient. And so what, what I mean when I say I want to equip you is I'm going to give you throughout the day practical strategies that will empower you. I'm going to give you some emotional intelligence tricks and hacks and tools that will keep you sustainable uh, through this, uh, you know, in, in your journey in education. Here's a picture that I think captures how I felt the last two years. Like that's me. And, and honestly, that's me on a good day, right? Um, because I'm above water, but there have just been so many days I didn't even feel like I was above water. And it's like every day you wake up and there's just continual waves and wind and, you know, high seas and tides and spray and, you're just trying to stay afloat. And I don't know if you can see this, but over here, these are seagulls, you know, and in my mind, they're just pooping all over the deck of that ship. That's supposed to be a joke. Don't be offended. But, you know, I mean, how many of you have felt like over the last two years, there are seagulls and you name your seagull and it's just pooping on you, you know, kick a person while they're down, you know, it's just adding insult to injury. So that's what my last two years have, have felt like. Um, and um, my undergraduate degree is in English. And uh, through the, the midst of some of my most difficult times, um, it was my undergraduate degree in English that was really helpful. And, and specifically, there's a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he said this, the wise man in the storm prays to God not for safety from danger, but for deliverance from fear. It's the storm within that endangers him, not the storm without. And that really just sort of captures what I want to do uh, in my role as a psychologist working in schools and education, working with educators, is, um, man, I, I can't do anything uh, to, um, to stop the waves of racial discord, you know, or to stop the, the strong winds of political discord or the strong currents of financial uncertainty. Uh, I can't do anything to fix that. But there's a storm within each of us, and um, we have a lot of power over that. And so my goal, again, as a psychologist, is to give you this EQ skill set that will empower you to calm the storm within. Um, and that's my whole uh, purpose and point today. Um, and I am super excited about it. Um, so let's get back to, oh, let me, sorry, there we go, back to the PowerPoint. Um, yep, sorry. <laughs> I got, I got off track on my, my presentation there. Um, so number one, my, my first goal, if you will recall, is that I want to encourage you. Um, step one, right out of the gate, I just want you to know that what you do doesn't just matter. It will matter for generations. And um, I'm going to start that process of encouraging you by sharing with you um, something happened to me um, on Monday, August 25th, 2008. That was so significant for me. It literally changed the course of my career, literally. Um, that day, Monday, August 25th, 2008, was my first day in my life ever as a real live substitute teacher. It sucked. It was so devastating for me to be a substitute. I'm going to boo it. I'm going to boo it, right? I learned a lot, but man, it was a tough day. Um, there's so much I could tell you about what a train wreck that day was, but let me give you some of the low lights. I remember I was on my campus at, at 7 a.m. You know that morning and I was gonna make a difference, man. I was gonna change kids' lives. I could feel it in my bones. Um, and so the kids came into the classroom um, and um, th this was here in our, our local school district. Um, 
and uh, it was chaos. It was chaos. This was the the first Monday of school. They were there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They had the weekend off, so this was their first Monday back at school. Um, and so they were still disoriented and confused. They didn't recognize me. I wasn't the teacher they had the week before because their teacher was out. And kids were screaming and running and jumping, third grade class. And um, one kid literally walked in the classroom. He got on tables and started jumping across tables. And and I um, I freaked out. I freaked out. Like I had this this deer in the headlight moment, like, uh, 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 what am I supposed to do here? You know? And I started to panic, you know, it's like, all right, Adam, calm down. You're a school psychologist. You got this, you know? So my first thought was behavior intervention. Adam, you need a behavior intervention for these kids, you know? So I'm thinking behavior intervention, what do I, and then my second thought was research-based behavior intervention. I, I didn't want the RCI police, you know, to, to, to carry me away. So I'm thinking, what do I do? What do I do? So bing, the light bulb goes off. Like my friend says, this ain't rocket surgery. Everybody knows if you've got a room of rowdy inner city third grade kids, all you have to do to put the fear of God in them, you just write their name on the board. So that was going to be my tier one research-based intervention. I was going to write kids' names on the board. And I said, but here's the deal. I'm no idiot. I know that not everybody's going to have the fear of God put in them when I write their name on the board. So for those kids who don't have the fear of God put in them, with my tier one intervention, tier two, I'm going to take it up a level. I'm going to give them a check mark, right? So that was my whole deal. That was my intervention was I'm going to write names and give check marks. So um, right before lunch, um, we're we're about to go and um, for, for lunch. And um, I'm trying to make this big dramatic point to the kids about how bad their behavior was and how disappointed the teacher was going to be. I said, you know, it's really sad. I said in... Um, in, in five minutes, we're about to go to lunch, but let me check. And so I turn around, and I start counting names on the board. And I said, 28 of you are going to be stuck in here with me at recess because you're bad behavior. <laughs> and so this little girl in the back of the classroom, she raised her hand. She said, sir, there are only 22 kids in this classroom. <laughs> what is your name, little girl? I'm going to give you a check mark. And so it was just stupid stuff like that all day long. It was a um, just an absolute master's workshop in how not to lead a classroom. So the bell rings, they go out to lunch. I go to the teacher's lounge and I grab my Venti Starbucks and my bologna sandwich. I'm a shell of a man and it's 11.15 in the morning. So I walk into the teacher's lounge and um, I just sit down. The lounge was empty and I just sat down and plopped myself down at this first table I could find. And this teacher walked in. And um, I knew her. She was actually my, like my kids had gone to this elementary school. Um, and so they knew me. I knew them. So this this kindergarten teacher walked in who was my kid's kindergarten teacher, all, all four of them. And she said um, she she wasn't expecting to see me there. You know, she didn't know I was substitute teaching that day. And <laughs> she walks in and, she, and it was this weird moment. Right. She sees me sitting there at my table with my Vinti Starbucks and my bologna sandwich and PTSD written across my forehead. And she's, you know, she wasn't expecting it. So she walks over and, and in this very sweet kindergarten teacher kind of way, she walked over and she just very quietly, she put her hand on the desk and she said, Dr. Signs, is there anything I can do to help you? And I looked at her, you know, for a moment and, and I said, actually, yes, ma'am, there is. I said, listen, I know you don't know me that well but I'm going to ask you a question and I just need you to give me an honest answer. And she said, okay, I can do that. I said, great. I said, ma'am, where on this campus do y'all keep the red wine? And then she laughed. Ah, ha, ha, Dr. Signs, you're so funny. I said, sister, I'm not joking. I need a drink. Where do you keep it? She wouldn't give it up. Two seconds after I sat down with my bologna sandwich, another bell rang. It was time to go back to my classroom. And I regressed. I regressed. I remember walking down the hallway from the teacher's lounge to my classroom thinking like, I have not cried in a public school since 1978. This sucks. I want to go home. I mean, it was miserable, miserable. So I get to my classroom and we make it out of the, uh, you know, the, make it through the afternoon. Finally, the last bell rings and, and I'm, I'm like done, man, like just get me out of here. Right. 
So sure enough, man, the last kid to leave the classroom was the one that had been riding me the hardest all day long. Him and his little compadres back there in the corner, man, their goal was to break me down. He had a, he had, his name was on the board. He had a check mark. He had a hashtag. He had an exclamation point. It looked like his name and a blotted out profanity right next to it, you know? So he's the last one to leave. And um, I'm like, dude, just leave. I want to go home already. And he's taking his time, you know, well, right when he gets to the door, he stops and, and he turns and he looks at me and he says, uh, he says, Hey, Dr. Signs, you're pretty cool, man. Are you going to be my teacher again tomorrow? <laughs> I looked that kid straight in the eye. I said, Oh dear God, I hope not. So he left. And then the teacher from across the hall came over and she said, um, Adam, how did it go today? <laughs> I said, you know what? I don't think it went that well. And she said, really? I said, yes, ma'am, really? She said, let me ask you some questions. How many fights did you have to break up today? I said, well, none. She said, all right. How many kids did you have to chase across the railroad tracks today? I said, none. And she said, you had a great day. What are you talking about? So um, I got home that afternoon. I, I found my red wine. Um, and um, that was my day, my first day as a substitute teacher. And, and when I say uh, that it, it changed my career, it really did. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I like to use images a lot to capture meaning. You know, that saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. If I had one picture uh, to capture my first day as a substitute teacher, that's it. This is it. And let me just illustrate. I'm this guy right here. I'm this guy. And this is that third grade class squatting the collective rear end of their bad behaviors on my skill set, right? And you can see who's coming out on top. And it's not me, my friends. It is not me. So that was my first day as a substitute teacher. And, um, you know, when I say that it changed the course of my career, it really did, because I, at that point, I had been working in schools for about five or six years, and I was just going to quietly go into private practice and play golf on Fridays, right? That was my life plan. Um, but what happened after that first day of substitute teaching was, um, after I recovered, um, I got really curious, you know, because part of what I did as a school psychologist was this thing called consultation. And so these are like, the kid, Adam, these are kids, we've tried everything, nothing's worked. Please come and work with our teachers and give us recommendations. And I would give recommendations to teachers. And I would, um, when I would give my recommendations, I would get what I called the look. And um, you didn't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure out what the look was saying. Um, the look was just sort of like teachers would look at me like, are you kidding me? You expect me to do what with this kid? Um, and um, I could tell like they're not buying into my recommendations and I didn't get it. You know, it's like in theory, this is what we're supposed to be doing. But when I make these recommendations to teachers, they look at me like I'm an idiot. So I said, man, I want to start substitute teaching because I want to see if my experience in a classroom in any way informs the recommendations that I was making. Um, and so that's why I started substitute teaching back in, in 2008. Um, and it, being a substitute teacher did not change the recommendations that I make. Um, in fact, it, it just reinforced that the recommendations that I was making were the right ones. Um, but here's what changed after that very first day of substitute teaching. It was this, hey, Adam, guess what, big guy? It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, where you got them from, what you think you know about education, um, unless you've actually taught in a classroom day in, day out, unless you've actually done the work. There's no way you will ever understand or appreciate how incredibly demanding um, that role is. It was a huge insight for me. It reminded me of a T-shirt I saw one time. Uh, and this T-shirt said, those who can teach and those who can't make laws for those who teach. And I was sort of that guy, you know, just had no clue. So again, I was thinking after five or six years in school, I was going to go into private practice and live a quiet life. But the more I substitute taught, the more I became fascinated with this, like, oh, my gosh, this thing is so hard called being a classroom teacher. How do you get good at it? Number one. And number two, how do you get good at it and stay good at it? What what drives sustainability for an educator? Um, and I just I couldn't put those questions down. I was just so um, preoccupied. Right. So then I started uh, doing research and really looking into that. And I thought, well, I'm not qualified to answer the question about the classroom teacher experience. I have a PhD in psychology. I have a doctorate of ministry in pastoral counseling. I've never been a teacher. I've never been an administrator. I'm not qualified. Um, but then I started thinking about it like, well, hold on, Adam, you've got a PhD in psychology. You have a doctorate of ministry. 
why don't you look at the the spiritual or existential variables that drive vocational satisfaction? And then why don't you look at the psychological variables that drive vocational satisfaction and then distill that to the world of an educator? And so then I got really excited. I thought I'm actually qualified to answer those questions. And so I started doing my research back in 2008, you know, just sort of looking at this. So um, in 2012, I wrote this book, The Power of a Teacher. And the theme of that book was, hey, just be well in your calling. So this, keep in mind, this was 10 years ago. Right now, self-care and wellness is a pretty popular topic, especially after the pandemic. But man, I was preaching this message 10 years ago. And back then, no one really got it, but people are getting it. So, uh, and I'll be touching on this later this afternoon. What what does holistic self-care look like? Being a good steward of your, your job and your money and your emotions and your body and your relationships. Then, um, let me skip through this. Um, then in 2016, I wrote Relationships That Work. We know in education that relationships are the oil that keeps the gears from stripping. But the question is, how do you actually build relationships, you know? Um, and so in this book, The Relationships That Work, I talk about four what I call relational readiness skills. Um, and those are skills that everyone needs to make a relationship work, whether you're trying to connect with a student or a parent or a colleague or your spouse or your ex or your in-laws or whoever it is, whoever it is, there are four skills that you've got to practice to do your part of the work. And so that was that book. Um, and I'll talk on that again a little bit later this morning and this afternoon. And then most recently, I wrote the EQ intervention. And that's really about our, our SEL work in schools and the EQ work that we're doing in corporations around the, the world. Um, and that's really the, the deepest piece of that thing about calming the storm within yourself. That's what where emotional intelligence starts. That's a big half. Half of emotional intelligence is me knowing myself and regulating myself. And the other half of it is me knowing you and connecting with you. And when those things work together, man, we, we build good teams. We do good work. So again, that's just an introduction to, to who I am and why this work is so important to me. Um, and yeah, that's that. So what I'm going to do, I, I, oh, before I move on, you know, people ask me all the time, like, hey, Adam, do you still substitute teach? And um, I actually do. Um, here, this is a picture from my, my uh, Instagram. This was last fall. Um, and I, I it was my first day. As a, I got to substitute teach. So that was my first day as a t substitute teacher last year at the high school. And I just, for fun, posted this on my Twitter uh, and says, any advice? And you'll see here, people really responded, you know, uh, a lot of comments. Um, one, one of my favorite, one of my favorite comments about any advice someone wrote in all caps, run period, like period, hell period. So here, I'm going to, I'm going to give that a laugh track. I think. I thought that was pretty clever. So anyway, so that's me and and why I'm here and what I'm all about and what I have planned for you today and 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 on and on. So uh, I told you again, my first goal in my time with you was that I wanted to encourage you. And, and specifically, I'm going to give you proof that what you do doesn't just matter. It's going to matter for generations. It really will matter for generations. I could talk through data and research to prove my point, but instead of doing that, I'm going to share a couple of case studies with you. And I think me talking through these case studies will bring this to life to you in a way that I, I can't do with research. Um, the, the kids that I'm going to be talking about, they're real kids. Um, you, many of you are special ed. You understand FERPA. You understand confidentiality and privacy. Um, keep in mind with these two people, uh, I, with these two kids, I have parental consent for both of them. So real kids, real cases. Um, so let me, let me introduce you to these two kids. The boy on the left is a sixth grader. The girl on the right is a fourth grader. Um, and as I talk through these two cases, there are two questions I'm going to come back to. Number one, do you care about me? And number two, can I make the rules? I mean, the, these questions, there's so much psychology packed into those two questions. But let me just say this. Every kid wants to know those two questions. The first question, do you care about me? That's a question of love. Uh, I need to know that you love me. And the second question is, do I make the rules or do you make the rules? That's a question of respect. And kids need to know, anyone needs to know, if we're going to ask them to surrender control and follow us, Anytime there's a leader follower dynamic in any capacity, a teacher with kids, an administrator with, with adults, with teachers, uh, a boss with employees, parents at home with kids, a coach with athletes. If you have a designated leader and a designated follower, the follower has to surrender control. 
So the follower really wants to know, hey, if you don't care about me, I'm not going to give you control of my life. That's a question of love. Second one, are you going to make the rules or am I? And that means once you start leading, are you strong enough and competent enough to get me where you say you want to take me? Or can I rise up and throw you off your game? Uh, that's a question of respect. Where you have no love and where you have no respect, you have no surrender of control. It's just that simple. Okay. So I'm going to come back to these two questions as I talk through my two case studies. So let's get back to the um, the first kid here. Um, Latino male. He comes from a low socioeconomic home, single, uninvolved parent, skipping school. He's got problems with the law, mental illness, and he's using street drugs. Any one of these demographic variables is a strike against a kid. Just being Latino, statistically speaking, means that your educational outcomes will be less than. Just coming from a low uh, socioeconomic home also strike against you, educationally speaking. But when you stack all of this into one kid, it's safe to say that this student or a student in this demographic profile represents the most challenging work we have in education. Our goal is to grow him academically and grow him uh, sort of socially, emotionally. And everything about this student's upbringing and, and environment works against our goals. Um, so he represents the most difficult work that we have. Um, and, and that can be frustrating for us. And, and I'm not even, this is like even before the pandemic, but then you add in a pandemic and then you add in virtual learning and how much school did he miss, all that. I mean, it, it, our, our work is cut out for us with a kid like this. And if we're honest as adults, we feel a lot of emotion. We feel frustrated. We feel angry. We feel scared. If we're really honest, we feel incompetent because we've tried everything and nothing's worked with this kid. He's what we call in psychobabble treatment resistant. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. And then on top of that, you have teacher shortages, you know, and, and there's not enough people to do this difficult work. And it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And so my guess is that, you know, as I describe this student, you've got one or two or seven or 30 or 50 on your caseload in your classroom that fits this profile and you feel my pain. So I get that. I get that. Well, this kid is not in sixth grade anymore. Of all things he grew up, he became a licensed psychologist and this is what he looks like today. Here, you know what? I'm going to give myself a round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to self-validate because I can, I control the, the soundboard here. Yeah, I was that kid. And so what I want to do to encourage you is I'm just going to share my story with you. Um, and uh, I'm going to share with you the two most difficult years of my life. Uh, the second most difficult year of my life um, was sixth grade. And the most difficult year of my life started the day after I graduated from high school. So let's go back to sixth grade. The setting is the 1980s. Uh, the location, uh, hold on, let me get back to my, my nerd geography map. Um, the location is way like, so you guys are way up here. I grew up right there. I grew up just north of Google <laughs> right there. That's where I grew up. So the setting is the 1980s. The location is called the, the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, the very southern tip of Texas, um, and mostly Latino, mostly Spanish speaking. There are about 3,200 counties in the United States. This was the fifth poorest per capita. Um, and um, I remember um, coming to school on the first day of sixth grade. I saw this teacher that I didn't like. I'd never had him before, but I didn't like him because word on the street was that um, you didn't make the rules with this teacher. Like he, they were his rules. And if you broke them, you were going to get a consequence. Um, and, uh, the second thing was this about this teacher was he didn't care about us. What he cared about was compliance. That's what floated his boat. It's like, you just do what I say to do because I'm the adult and you're not, he didn't, but he, so he cared about compliance, but he didn't care about us. And I knew that I was going to be in his classroom that year and I didn't like him. So I'm walking up to school first day of sixth grade. I see him standing there in the doorway with his arms crossed, just staring at me. Right. And I, I, just, I just got this bad energy and I'm thinking, man, you know what? I don't want to do this with you. Not on day one. So I started going around the, the back of the school because I didn't want to deal with him. Well, he followed me and he got up right into my space and, and he held out his hand. And he said, stop right there, young man. Listen, I want you to know something. I know who you are. Your name is Lou Signs. I know everything about you. I talked to your teachers from last year. I know you gave them a run for the money. I know you're skipping school. I know your mom's not in, involved in your life. I know your dad's not around. I know your older brother's about to drop out of high school. I know you're using drugs. I know you're, you've got problems with the law. Like I know everything about you. 
So don't even step onto my campus and act like you're all that because I got you figured out. But I want you to understand one thing, young man, from the get-go, I'm not going to put up with it. Your other teachers may have, but I'm not. He said, I promise you by spring break, I'll have you in line. He said, if, in fact, if you so much as even speak a word of Spanish in my classroom, me and you and this big brown paddle that I have right here, we're going to march down to the office and we're going to take care of business. And then he leaned over right into my face and he pointed his finger at me. He said, do you understand me, young man? I knew right away he meant business because he was Mr. T. That's what we called him, Mr. T, like Mr. T from the 18. The fact that he was Caucasian made it even richer that we called him Mr. T. I knew right away he meant business because I knew his reputation. Um, I leaned right back into his face on day one and I said, si entiendo, pendejo. Here, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boo that. Not appropriate. Not appropriate. I don't know if any of you speak Spanish up in Michigan. <laughs> but for those of you who don't, I will translate that. It means, yes, I understand perfectly. Please Google that before you roll that into your conversational Spanish. Fair warning. Well, it was a short honeymoon. He said if I broke his rules, we went off to the, we would, we, he would take care of business. So right away on day one, short honeymoon, bam, bam, bam you know, took, took me to, to the, the class, to the office and, and uh, hit me. Um, well, what happened was we got locked into a pattern every day to the office, from the office, to the office, from, if I had had an IEP, goal one would have been Lou will go to the office. I mean, that, that was all I did. Um, and he always had these one liners for me, you know, um, as we're walking down to the office, um, you couldn't make it through a single day. Could you Lou, you know, Lou, it must be your job to make my job. Hell. I mean, it was a beat down. And it wasn't just at, at school, it was at home too. You know, my mom was a single parent mom trying to do the right thing, but man, she was just out of her league, not equipped, not equipped in any way. And every day I got home, I would hear from my mom, ay, mijito, what have you done today? Ay, mijito, when will you learn? Ay, mijito, pues quien te manda? You know, why do you do these things? It was a beat down. Three things happened that year that made it the second most difficult year of my life. Number one, long story. Um, but two of my friends went to go buy some drugs. There was a shootout and my friends were murdered. Very next day, there I was back on my campus to the office, from the office, couldn't make it through a single day. Could you, Lou? Second thing that happened, and this was around November of that year, that was related to the first, uh, a group of young men from a rival broke into my home. They restrained me and they sexually assaulted my cousin. For a number of reasons, I couldn't talk about it. But the very next day there, I was back on my campus to the office, from the office, you know, must be your job to make my job hell. Well, the third thing that happened is that I was arrested for possession. And man, I will never forget the look on my mom's face when she walked into to juvenile to pick me up that time, the anger in her face. And I knew like, as soon as I saw her, I knew she was done with me. And the first words out of her mouth, Mijito, what are you doing here? And I remember thinking, what a stupid question to ask me. Are you kidding me? It wasn't a question of behavior. Like, well, I'm sitting in this chair with these handcuffs digging into my wrist. That's not what she was asking me. It was a question of identity. And I remember even back then thinking like, what a stupid question to ask me. Like, are you kidding me? I know who I am. I'm loose signs. It's my job to make your life hell. I'm never going to learn. I can't make it through a single day. I mean, these are messages I got my whole life. What am I doing here? Where else would I be? Well, Child Protective Services was never involved with my family, but my mom could read the writing on the wall. Uh, she knew I had an older brother that was at risk of dropping out and things didn't look good for me. So she voluntarily relinquished parental rights. And um, I went from living in South Texas to move several hundred miles away in what was then this tiny rice farming town outside of Houston called Katy, Texas. And it was culture shock. I mean, I had, you know, I grew up in a place that was mostly Latino, mostly Spanish speaking, mostly poor. This was a middle, upper middle class farming community. I'd never seen so many pickup trucks in my life. Nobody spoke Spanish. Nobody spoke English the way I spoke English. Nobody dressed the way I dressed. Nobody listened to my music. Um, I mean, it was, I was the token brown boy, but I was good because I said, none of these kids know any of those kids back home. None of these teachers know any of those teachers back home. The family that I live with, they love me well. And I couldn't score a joint to save my life. And Lord knows I tried, but there was no dope in the rice paddy. I did pretty well at Katie Junior High and, and Katie High School. But my senior year, uh, my depression, uh oh, hold on. There we go. My depression kicked back in because the family that I lived with, they said, listen, you need to understand something. When you graduate, you're on your own. Like you're 18 and you go live your life, you know? 
we've done everything we can do. And I was terrified because I knew like, no, once, once I leave this structure, I'm screwed. I never could have articulated it back then. But what was happening is that the adults in my life were functioning as my frontal lobe. They were the ones organizing my life and making sense of my life, not me. Um, and, and I never told anybody about my trauma or my past. You know, my thinking back then was you forget the past and you move on. And man, it just doesn't work that way. Certainly not with trauma. And even then, back in the 80s, there was so much stigma around mental illness. Like nobody talked about depression or anxiety. I never would have said anything anyway. Well, I graduated from Katy High School in May of 1985. The very next day, I started the most difficult year of my life. I ended up in San Antonio. I was working as a dishwasher. Um, I was living in a shack behind a, a house, um, a room really smaller than the studio, and it had a shower and a toilet, and I was working as a dishwasher. I had a sleeping bag, a pillow, a suitcase with some clothes, and a box of journals, and that box of journals was my prized possession. Um because I had learned all the way back in sixth grade that between the covers of a journal really was my only safe place in the world. So I'd learned to use journaling as a therapy tool. Well, by now it's like uh, March of uh, like almost a year after I graduated from high school and I was not doing well, struggling with depression and anxiety, working as a dishwasher. And I remember coming home from work one morning, it was about 3 a.m. Um, I was really um, just depressed and overwhelmed and tired. And I thought, you know what? I need to get, I need to write. I need to get some thoughts and feelings out. So I remember I laid out my sleeping bag and I turned on my little lamp in my, my shack and I reached into my journal box, you know, to start journaling. And when I, and, and this was the journal, by the way, this, this journal, I still have it all these years later. And when I reached in to get my journal box, I looked in the bottom of my journal box and I saw these two pieces of paper and I didn't know what it was. And so I was like, what is this? And so I reached in and I found two pieces of paper, and they were letters that had been written to me by two of my teachers my senior year at Katy High School. And I had completely forgotten about this, but then I looked at it and I said, oh, that's right. It was literally my last day of high school at Katy High School as I, one was my English teacher and one was my creative writing teacher. And as I was walking out of each of their classrooms, each one of these teachers handed me a letter and said, here, read this when you get a chance. You know, back then I was like, yeah, whatever. I just want to get out of here. Well, I, I put, got these letters and I stuck them in my backpack. Well, evidently they'd ended up in the bottom of my bottom of my journal box. And now almost a year later, I'm finally reading them blown away at what I found. Let, let me just show you here real quick. So check this out. Let, let that focus in for a minute. Um, look at the date at the top of that. Hold on one sec. There it is. May 23rd, 1985. That was my last day of high school. You'll see that it's addressed Dear Lou. And at the bottom, it says, sincerely, Joe Ella Exley. She was my, my English teacher. And then this letter here at the very top, uh, you'll see that it is addressed to Lou, right? And then the very bottom, you'll see that it's signed Mrs. McR, Mrs. McRoberts. That was my creative writing teacher. So those two teachers, the, these letters uh, were, were written to me by those two teachers. And so here I am finally reading these letters for the first time, blown away at what these letters said. Um, hold on one sec. Let me get to the PowerPoint here. This is part of what one of those letters said from Ms. Exley. You're extremely talented and intelligent, but most importantly, you have a good heart. I know you will use your talents to help your fellow man. That's the most satisfying life a person can have. It said some other things, but that's what jumped out. And it was signed by Joella Exley. Second letter. Um, don't quit writing, especially in your journal. Someday it may be the basis for your book. You have insight, sensitivity, intelligence, maturity beyond your tender years, keeping you your special person. And again, it said some other things, but that's what jumped out. And those words, oh my gosh, they destroyed me. They destroyed me because I remember thinking like, no, 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 hold on. I know who I am. I'm Lou Signs. I'm a 19-year-old version of that sixth grade kid that's never going to make it through a single day, whose job it is to make your life hell, who's never going to learn. I, I live in a shack. Um, I'm working as a, a, a dishwasher. I've got no family. I've got no money. I've got no hope. I've got no future. I've got nothing but crying spells, sleep disturbances, panic attacks, social anxiety, and a big bag of dope that if I'm lucky will get me through the day. I know who I am, right? 
But here were these two teachers for whom I had tremendous respect that were disagreeing with me. And because of who they were, not just as teachers, but as human beings, the way they lived their life in front of us, practicing and living emotional intelligence before it was even a thing, they were disagreeing with me. And I couldn't blow them off because I knew like they're not going to write these words if they didn't absolutely believe it. You know, and so back and forth, I went like, who's right about me? I think I know who I am. But here are two teachers that are saying something different. And it, it tortured me for weeks. And so finally, I said, here's the deal. This is ridiculous. I'm going to create a test that I know I'm going to fail. Once I fail the test, that's all the proof I need to go on and live my miserable life. Here's the test. I'm going to try to get into college. Man, I have no idea how you get into college. Neither of my parents went to college. Brown kids where I grew up didn't go to college. Let me just try. When I fail, then I could just in my own heart say like, Miss McRoberts, Miss Exley, that was really sweet, but I had you fooled. Okay. Well, I got on a bus after work one day and took a bus to UTSA, the University of Texas at San Antonio. Bus pulls up in front of the John Peace Memorial Library at UTSA. I step off the bus. My very first experience on a college campus was a freaking panic attack. My mind started racing. My heart was beating. I couldn't catch my breath. You don't belong here. You're out of your league. You're not college material. You're never going to make it. You're not good enough. You're not like the rest of these kids. Who do you know that has a college degree? You got no money. You're not smart enough. And I just went, I found the admissions office, met some women that were just wonderful. And they case managed me through every step of the way. Fill out this application, fill out your financial aid form. We need to get your transcripts. Um, you need to write an essay, da, 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 da. I spent the whole afternoon up there doing everything they said. At the end of the day, I was done, got on a bus, went back to the restaurant and worked the night shift. So this was like March or April, you know, uh, almost a year after I graduated from high school. Fast forward, it's July, and uh, the manager came back into the I was back there sweating and in San Antonio, sweating, uh, covered in grease and doing my thing as a dishwasher. And the manager came back and he said, hey, Lou, you got a letter here from UTSA. And I remember asking him, what's UTSA? <laughs> and he said, the University of Texas at San Antonio, Einstein. And then I was like, oh, I forgot I applied to college, you know. Um, so then in my mind, I was thinking, okay, so this is my Maury Povich moment. You know, the results are in. There's a 99.99% chance that you're rejected, right? And I opened up the letter and it said, um, congratulations, you've been admitted. And I remember thinking like, um, there's no way. There's no way. And so I got on a bus and I went back to UTSA after, after my shift. And I said, listen, man, I think you all messed up. That's my name. That's my DOB. That's my SSN. And it says, congratulations. So what's up? So they, they said, no, no, you're in. Congratulations. And I thought, all right. But that doesn't answer the question about who's right about me. You know, the question isn't obviously, can I get into college? Because evidently they'll take any idiot with a Pell Grant into this university. The question is, can I do college? It's just a moot point. I can't do this. Well, the first class I had to take that fall was like a remedial English. And I thought, thank God. If I have any hope of passing a college course, it's got to be English. That was always my favorite subject in high school. So I took this course. And at the end of the semester, not only did I pass and I, I made an A. And um, so back to this question, who's right about you, Adam? It's like, okay, Adam, you got your first bit of data in. And right now the data are arguing in favor of your teachers, not in favor of you. You know, the question is, can you do college? And you got your first hard bit of evidence that said, maybe you can. So for the first time in my life, I wasn't saying that my teachers were right, but I was cracking open the door to the possibility maybe they were right and maybe I was wrong. On the one hand, on the other hand, this A could have been a clerical error for all I know. I need more data. Let me take another course next spring. So I took another course that spring and I passed it. And I just kept going back and I'm like, all right, man, I'm going to keep showing up. Like eventually I'm going to fail out when I'm a sophomore. I, I know I can't do that but I'm going to keep showing up until they run me off. And then, well, I'm a junior now. I can't do this. I'm going to fail out. This is where my sidewalk ends. And then I made it through my junior year. Now I'm a senior now. I've got to write a, a thesis on Shakespeare. I can't do, I'm going to fail out. Just before I turned 27 years old, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in English. And I just had to take a hard look and say like, they were right. They were right. This is who you've always been. You were wrong. And so in my own heart, I finally gave myself permission to believe my teachers. And I said, you know what? I'm done being Lou. 
I'm done being that kid whose job it is to make your life hell, who's never going to learn, who can't make it through a single day. And then just psychologically as a way to give myself permission to be somebody else, I said, man, I'm going to start going by my first name now. I'm going to be Adam. So if you look at my book here, you'll see on the cover, it says Adam L. Signs. L is Lewis. And I've always been Lou. And I'm like, man, I'm done being Lou. I'm going to go by my first name now. I'm going to be Adam. Maybe Adam can live into this life that those educators saw in him so many years ago. And that was the beginning of change. I, I got a job, you know, working as a case manager for kids in foster care. Um, I finally had benefits. I finally got therapy, finally got medication, finally got treatment for my trauma. And I said, man, I want to get a master's in counseling. I want to figure out what the hell happened to me. I want to unpack my stuff. Got my master's, eventually got a PhD, trained at Harvard, trained at Brown. I mean, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful academic ride. Um, but I, I'm here to tell you, like, I would not, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunities that my education has afforded me. Absolutely. But education did not change my life. Educators did. It was men and women just like you that 40 years ago could have said, they don't pay me enough to put up with a punk like that. And they would have been exactly right. They did not get paid enough to put up with a punk like me, but man, by God's grace, man, those women said, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? So I'm deeply indebted. And when I say uh, out of all the things that I do as a psychologist, I, I have an outpatient clinic. Um, I see I see clients in my private practice. I work at the I teach at the medical school at Texas A&M. This sprinkles on my cupcake. The thing I love most is working with you, working with educators, because I would not be here if it weren't for you. Um, so one final note on this case study. If you ever happen to be in Katy, Texas, and you're driving down Westheimer Park, where you're going to see that building, and that's Joe Ella Exley Elementary. Round of applause for Mrs. Axley, man. She's a rock star in my book. If you ever happen to be driving down Franz Road, you're going to see that building, and that's Polly McRoberts Elementary. And man, another round of applause for Polly McRoberts. She is a freaking rock star in my book. So that's it, man. That's my story. And I definitely am sticking to it. Um, I'm going to go about another 10 minutes and then I'm going to stop for, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's going to be a fun, some, somebody's going to score some stuff. We're going to do a call in and somebody's going to score some goods. Um, but let me, let's go to the second kid. This was Maya Chavez. And when I look at that picture of Maya, her smile does not convince me. Um, I think about who this girl was when that picture was taken. I think, man, what does this kid have to smile about? She had been in the custody of protective services for two years already in her young life. She had experienced things that no human being should ever have to experience, let alone a little girl. And we sit her down in front of a camera and tell her to say, cheese, what's her to smile about? Well, as many of you already know, what happens, man, when you grow up in, in a chaotic family, whether protective services is involved or not, if you experience trauma, your base layer of emotion is anxiety slash fear slash stress. Functionally, it's all the same thing because you never know what to expect. And I'm not talking about from year to year or month to month or day to day. I'm talking about from moment to moment. Is this going to be the moment when somebody walks into my room and touches me? Is this going to be the moment when the bullets come flying through the window? Is this going to be the moment when somebody knocks on my door and say, ma'am, we're here to take your kids away? Now, is this going to be the moment? Now is this going to be the moment? And when you live in that kind of high stakes unpredictability, neurologically speaking, your sympathetic nervous system never shuts down. You live in fight or flight. You never get to the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. And learning just really isn't an option when you're living in that mode. And that's the life um, that um, Maya was living. Well, then what happens is um, if the parents aren't doing what they need to be doing, Protective services will get involved and remove the child and put them in foster care. And we in our adult minds think, well, good, at least the kid's in a safe place now. Sort of. But what the kid is thinking is like, you know what, that family may have been crazy, but they were my crazy and I don't have them. So you add to the first layer of emotion, the anxiety, another layer of emotion, and that's sadness and grieving because they're grieving the loss of their biological family. And man, what those kids know about that building called school and the adults in that building is that that building and those adults are the safest, most predictable part of their world. And if they're going to act out all of those feelings of, of rage, of depression, of sadness, of loss, whether they can articulate it or not, they know that building and those adults are the safest place to do it. And while that makes our calling extremely difficult at times, in some ways, it's a badge of honor when kids are acting out because they're saying, you're safe, I can get this out with you. 
Well, then what happens is that if kids aren't adopted by the time they're like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, statistically speaking across the nation, the likelihood that they will ever be adopted, it drops dramatically. So then you add a third layer of emotion and that's hopelessness because kids know like, man, the adoption ship sailed and I wasn't on it. And they know like my trajectory is that I'm going to, I'm going to be in care until I'm 18. Um, then I'm going to age out. And then it's like, good luck, God bless, you know? Um, and, and associated with those feelings of hopelessness are peripheral thoughts and feelings. I'm damaged goods. I'm a reject. I'm unlovable. I'm an outcast. I'll never fit in. I'll never belong. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. It's miserable. Then those kids often start acting out, not just where it's safe, which is in schools. They start acting out where it's not safe and that's out in the street. So then you have a history of interaction with the legal system, probation officers, ankle monitors, court dates, you know, it's, it's just crazy. It's crazy. And if you ever have a family that's even thinking about adopting a kid like this, the state worker will sit the family down at a table and pull out stacks and stacks of paperwork, um, office referral, inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, behavior reports, uh, probation officer notes, psychological evaluations, diagnoses, medications, because the state is saying, hey, listen, man, if you're going to adopt a kid with special needs, you need to know exactly what you're signing up for. This is not going to be a bait and switch. And who's going to want to sign up for that? Well, like many kids in her situation, uh, Maya ended up in uh, court in Bryan, Texas. She ended up in Judge Cindy Miller's court. She stood in front of Judge Miller as a 10-year-old Judge Miller slammed her gavel and changed Maya's life forever. Um, but for Maya, the circumstances were a little bit different because a family read her file and they said, we know exactly what we're signing up for. And on that day, uh, March of 2010, Judge Miller slammed her gavel and made it official. Uh, and that was the day that she changed Maya's life forever. And Maya Chavez became Maya Signs. And that was the day that my wife and I and our biological kids adopted her. Uh, there we are with the judge on our adoption day. I'm, I'm rocking the cue ball hair there. That was during the summer. I shaved my head during the summer. Sorry, I had to point that out. Uh, but that was a great, great day for us. That was on a Tuesday when we adopted Maya. Very next Saturday, um, Maya and I had our very first daddy-daughter dance. And there we are getting ready for the daddy-daughter dance. And she was so cute. I remember I said, all right, sweet girl. Um, you're beautiful. You've got a new dress. You've got new shoes. I said, here's the deal. Before we go out to dinner, I'm going to, uh, before we go to the dance, I'm going to take you out to eat dinner anywhere that you want to go. And uh, man, her eyes lit up. She said, are you kidding me? Anywhere I want to go. I said, anywhere you want to go, you name it. Steak, seafood, lobster. I don't care. So she chose and we had some Chick-fil-A baby. <laughs> Chick-fil-A in our formal wear. It was the bomb.com. Um, and so I remember we ate and we went to, to, to the dance uh, at the school and, uh, we got to the dance and, um, you know, we were still getting to know each other. She'd only been with us for about uh, six months. Like she'd come to live with us in foster care. And then six months later we adopted her and, um, we were still getting to know each other. And I remember all day just thinking like, I want to make one point of connecting with her, you know? So we get to the dance at the school and we go to the cafeteria and we get our punch and we're just sitting there and uh, listening to music and, and things got kind of quiet, you know, for a minute. And I said, um, I said, sweet girl, um, do you mind if I hold your hand for a minute? And she said, no, no problem at all. And so I remember I, I reached over and I held her hand um, and I took this little picture here. And I said, sweetheart, let's talk. Um, there are two things that we need to talk about. Uh, number one, you have a job. And number two, I have a job. Let's talk about your job. Thing number one, your job is to follow the rules. I said, you don't make the rules in our family. Mom and I do. There's not a comma at the end of that statement. There's not a question mark at the end of that statement. There's a period. You don't make the rules. We do. Your job is to follow them. My hope is that by the time you're 18, you've earned enough of our trust that you're making your own rules. But for right now, you're, you're 10. Like you don't make rules. We do. You follow them. You understand that? She said, oh, yes, sir. I said, awesome. Thing number two, I have a job. Do you know what my job is? And she said, oh, yes, sir. Your job is to make sure that I follow the rules. And I smiled and I said, no, ma'am. I said, look, I want you to look at my eyes when I tell you this, because this is one of the most important things I will ever, ever say to you. I said, sweetheart, my job is to lay my life down for you. My job is to love you, to comfort you, to protect you, to guide you, to nurture you, to encourage you, to keep you safe. 
I said, sweetheart, you don't understand this about yourself yet, but you're the most precious thing on the planet. There is no pile of gold anywhere on the planet more valuable than you, not even in the same category. And my job is to lay my life down so that you will understand your value. Because once you understand your value, you will live as though your choices matter. I said, sweetheart, you will understand that just like me, you were not a mistake. You have a, a calling, you have a purpose, you have a destiny. And I said, listen, I get it. You're going to push us and test us when, when we say we make the rules and you don't. You're going to push us and you're going to test us when we say we care, we love you and we care about you. I said, I'm not going to like that. It's going to make me angry and frustrated, but I just want you to know there's nothing you can ever do ever that will ever separate you from my love for you. I will always be your father. You will always be my girl. Nothing will change that. I said, listen, my trust, I don't give that away. You got to earn it. But my love is a gift. And all you have to do is receive it. And then I remember in a moment of incredible insight, she looked at me and she said, dad, I don't think I've ever been loved that way before. And I remember I smiled and I said, oh, sweetheart, believe it or not, I know exactly how you feel. I said, let me tell you a story about a kid I used to know. His name was Lou. And I shared my story with her just as I've shared it with you. And as I shared my story with her, I could see deep in her soul, man, she wasn't saying this place is going to be good and safe for me, but I could see she was just cracking open the door to the possibility. Maybe this will work out. Maybe this will work out. And it was a powerful moment. It was a powerful moment in our relationship. And the reason I share my daughter as a case study is just to underscore the generational power. Remember, I told you, I told you that I was going to give you proof that what you do doesn't just matter. It matters for generations. You know, when I think about the men and women that invested in me and poured into me and loved me, when quite frankly, I was not the best version of myself, how do I look at a girl like this and not bring her into my life? I mean, that's the, it was done for me and it's the least I can do to give back. Um, and so that's why I share my daughter as a case study. So my wife and I were married in 1995. We celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary in September. Um, this is what our kids look like in 2002. There's my daughter, Alisa, on the left. There's my son, Isaiah, in the middle. And there's Andrew on the right. This was 2008. There's Ali Isaiah on the left, Alisa in the middle, and Andrew on the right. This was 2010. There's my daughter, Alisa, on top. There's Isaiah on top. Andrew on the bottom. And there's my daughter, Maya. This was about 2016, 2017. That was on campus at Texas A&M. And this was last Thanksgiving. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, we are, um, we are, are very blessed uh, to be living the life that we're living. I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Last thing I'm going to do, and then what we're going to do this, this call in, um, is I, I told you that uh, what you do doesn't just matter. It will matter for generations, and it will matter for generations to come. And so I've sort of illustrated that. But here's the deal. What you do will matter in generations that haven't even been born yet. So check this out. Uh, this was Mario Esteban Holmes. He was born September 22nd, 2021, seven pounds, eight ounces. So that, uh, my, my daughter Maya now is 22 years old, and that's her son, just born last year. Um, so here's, here's something to think about. Uh, if he lives an average life, let's say he lives to be 80, that puts him to the year 2100, as weird as that sounds. What I know about the life that Mario will live as an adult is that it will be different than when, when you think about his biological mother, who is my daughter, Maya, when you look at how she, what she was born into and the life she lived the first 10 years, you wouldn't expect Mario's outcomes to be that good. But I know it's going to be better because we can already see Maya parenting little Mario in ways that she was never parented before. We already see a difference. And I know that that baby is going to grow up and live a different, better life than his mother did because of how she's bringing him up. And why is that the case? Well, because someone intervened in his mother's life. Well, who intervened? It was me and my wife and our kids. We intervened and we adopted her um, 10, 11, 12 years ago. Okay, so why did we intervene? Well, because back in the 80s, there were two teachers that reached out and said, by God, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure this kid has everything he needs to be successful. Um, I 
and all these years later, um, a baby was born who will live a different life um, because of what two teachers did many, many years ago. That's the power that you have. That's the reality of what you're doing. Um, that's why my hope for you um, is that well, you, you will love yourself well enough and honor yourself deeply enough to calm the storm within you, to prioritize your self-care. Because what you're doing is so, so important. People outside of education, they don't get it. They, they just don't get it. It's just so sad to me that people that aren't educators, they don't understand education and they think they know, but they don't. They're never going to get it. But we know, you know, we, we know what we do. And um, so I told you I wanted to encourage you. Be encouraged. Just know that, again, my life is living proof that what you do absolutely matters. And it doesn't just matter today. It's going to matter, man, when, when some of us are, we're long gone, man. We're going to be pushing daisies. But the, the, the power of our work will echo for generations. So know, know that what you do matters. All right. So the last thing we're going to do, I've got about 10 minutes here. I want to do a call-in giveaway. So I'm, um, I'm about 150 years old right now. I look good for my age, if I say so myself. But when I was a kid, there was this thing called AM radio. Um, AM radio. And uh, the DJ would say, all right, third caller, call in, and you're going to score two tickets to the Led Zeppelin concert, right? So I'm that old. Um, so we're going to sort of do that. Uh, I, we have a dedicated studio, uh, a dedicated phone in our studio, and I'm going to invite you to call in. The first person to call in and get through on the line, you're going to score a free copy of my book, The Power of a Teacher, a free copy of my book, The EQ Intervention, so two books. And you know what, man? I'm going to go and go ahead and throw in a $50 Visa gift card. See, it, it just got real. It just got real, my friends. $50 Visa gift card? Are you kidding me? Shut up. Yeah. So first thing you, so I'm going to show you a phone number, but before you call, you got to mute the sound on your computer because when you call in, it's going to make this weird feedback. Okay. So what, what we're going to do is I'm going to say, go ahead and mute your phone, your, your computers now, wherever you are in the great state of Michigan. Upper Peninsula, wherever you are, I'm going to give you a number, call in, and we're going to see who gets in first. So step one right now, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do a little drum roll here to, to build the excitement, right? Build the excitement. Okay. So with that, now go ahead and mute your computer, and here's the number to call. Mute your computer. The number to call. There you go. Oh, uh, we got a call coming in. This is Adam. Who is this? Nope. Oh, hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. Let me get you plugged in here. The, the studio line is not quite plugged in. There we go. Who is this? This is Angela Rayhorn. Angela Rayhorn. Hold on. Let me give you a round of applause. Okay. So I'm going to go to the chat. I'm going to go to the chat real quick. And I'm going to invite everyone to unmute. Unmute. Oh, it's, it says in mute. That's code for unmute. So go ahead and let, so Angela Rayhorn, is that right? Yes. All right, Angela. What, what's your jam up there? What do you do? I'm a special education teacher, resource oh. room, K, kindergarten through third grade. No, that's so cool. I'm hold on. I'm gonna take my jacket off and get warm here. <laughs> um, how long have you been doing this? Uh, this is my fourth year of teaching. Oh, cool. Um, so here's the deal. I'm going to send you, I'll show you how, how to email me. Um, but before we do that, like, what can you tell me, I, we're early in the year, but what is already exciting you about this school year? There's plenty to be discouraged about, and we got our work cut out for you, but can you, can you find something that, that you're really grateful for this year that, that feels good to you? Uh, one thing I'm really grateful for this year is the support of amazing colleagues oh, and cool. understanding colleagues. Um, I, I love my job. It can be uh, exhausting some days and I just don't see how I could do it without the people I work with. Oh, that's so good. Can, can you name something specific that feels good to you in terms of how you connect with them? Like, do y'all have rituals or just 
encouraging words or like what how do y'all like love and encourage each other uh just in person conversations in the hallway or about students encouraging mm. each other with ideas yeah excellent i love it okay so here's the deal i'm going to go back to the powerpoint down at the bottom it says adam at adamsigns.com can you see that yes email me please and say hey adam great to chat with you today this is the address i'd like you to send my book and my gift card to so 50 dollars visa gift card copy the eq intervention here copy of the power of a teacher combined retail value 50 dollars Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Round of applause. I really appreciate your words. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So there you go. That was fun. So congratulations to Andrew. She, she scored big <laughs> in our time together. Um, so for the rest of the morning and, and the afternoon, I'll just be doing a series of workshops on, you know, uh, um, behavioral escalation and how to deal with that in a relational way. Um, I forget what the other topics are. I know self-care is going to be a big one at the very end, holistic self-care, how to love yourself well. Super excited about this. I just want to give you practical strategies, things that you can do to keep yourself in the game. Man, my, my tagline these days is the most effective tier one intervention for every student. Man, I don't care if this student is general ed, special ed, teenager, PPCD. Um, Black, brown, white, uh, gay, straight, gifted and talented, slow. I don't care who the student is. The best intervention for every student is a healthy adult. It's adults that, that are practicing self-care, that are coming to the game, able to bring them their best selves to the table. That's what, what does the, the best work, is you being the best you. Um, and I know this sounds so contraindicated, but I'm here to tell you as a psychologist that specializes in child psychology, um, um, one of the most loving things you can do for people depending on you is to offer them the best version of you. It's to prioritize yourself. I know that sounds against the grain. We always talk about kids first, kids first, kids first. Well, here's my deal as a, as a parent of four and as a psychologist, um, is that if I want to prioritize my kids, one of the best things I can do for them is just make sure that I'm taking care of myself. It doesn't do me any good to burn myself out in a, in a frantic effort to love and serve them if I'm depleted. Uh, because at the end of the day, if I'm burned out and not able to engage the game, I'm not going to be any good to any one of them. So super excited about all of that. And I gotta, let's see, um, if you have any questions, we have a, let's see, my phone says that it's 1042. We got about three minutes. What questions do you have for me? I'm going to, I'm going to go over to the chat. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to get to any of them. Maybe I'll have time for one question. What question do you want to ask me about anything? And you're not going to ask me a question that's too personal or too private. Um, believe me, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable, obviously, sharing my story with complete strangers. So <laughs> any questions here, I'll play this. That always inspires thought. We're, we're classically conditioned to think when we hear that. Go to the chat. How do you get a copy of this video to share with your staff? How do you inspire your staff? Well, those are great questions. So, so how do you get a copy of the video? You can't get a copy. I, I don't. Well, I don't know if this this video is going to be available for broadcast or or what. Um, uh, UP has arranged for the, the access to this content, whether it's for members only or whatever, but. Uh, so Deb or someone help me out. If, if there's a link, then great. If you want a condensed version of this to share with your faculty, go to YouTube and just Google my TED talk. I did a TED talk at Yale and in 20 minutes, I share my story and my daughter's story, story very briefly. So that's one way. If, if, if you can't access this recording across the board, then you'll just get a 20 minute version of this, uh, on YouTube. How do you inspire staff? That's a great question. That's a long answer. Um, you you don't it's not a one and i'll tell you this christina thank you for asking it's not one and done you don't inspire a group of people with with a one hour pd or a one day pd 
you you make this your intention and you set up a training series over the course of a year that's all, that that very mindfully broadcast like hey we're here to love you we're here to serve you we're here to fill your cup and that's going to be a theme throughout our school year so you make if you really want to inspire them count the cost and set aside the time and money to find the training and whatever you need uh to, so that they'll know that they're seen and heard it's great that we bring donuts and coffee for a meeting like yeah that says something but you got to think bigger picture excellent question thank you christina what could a teacher have done to make you cared about in your hardest times uh jackie thank you for asking uh, th th um they could have just loved me uh and been empathetic you know so the 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 two districts that i grew up in the first one it's a tale of two cities they were very punitive very old school like you know, the floggings will continue until morale increases. That was essentially their MO. And it just, you know, if you come from trauma and somebody comes at you with this threatening sort of, I'll get you, it's not going to help. It just doesn't help versus let me be empathetic. Let me be kind. Let me be patient. Um, empathy, kindness, and patient cost a lot more in the long run than the paddle that my teachers used. Um, but th that's what helps. Uh, to get, to get, uh, yeah, thank you for asking that, uh, Christina. So there we go. Um, yeah, I think I'm over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right there. And Deb, I don't know if you or someone else wants to hop on and, and take over or where to go from here, but um, I will flip over to my PowerPoint um, and then I will um, let y'all take it away. Thank you for your time this morning, Adam. Uh, we will do, do some break slides at this time, uh, 1045 to 11. Thanks everybody. <laughs>